All right, uh, looks like we can begin. So welcome. And I will, I will tell you about uh, my project, which is called uh, Chimera Linux. But first, let me introduce myself a bit. Uh, I'm a software developer from the Czech Republic. Uh, I've been contributing to open source software since 2007. And currently, I'm a, on a break from work, so I'm kind of working on the distro full time. Uh, the, when I'm not on a break for work, I work uh, in the WebKit team in Egalia. Previously, I also used to work for Samsung uh, in the open source group, where I worked on the Enlightenment Foundation libraries and the Window Manager. Uh, since 2009, I've been using uh, FreeBSD, uh, also on desktop for about uh, 10 years. But uh, I've not been using that on desktop uh, since about 2018 because, uh, because I've been mostly using uh, power architecture computers these days, uh, which uh, FreeBSD doesn't have the greatest support for. So, uh, for example, my GPU wouldn't work. Uh, I'm also a former developer of, uh, of the Void Linux distribution, which has served uh, as a huge inspiration for this project, uh, especially in the design of, uh, of the packaging system. And I sort of uh, do all sorts of things uh, besides distribution development. I also do, for example, game development, uh, uh, compiler stuff. Uh, I did some kernel bits as well. But now, what's uh, Chimera Linux? It's a new Linux distribution which I started in uh, 2021, and it's a general purpose distribution created uh, from scratch. It utilizes uh, core tools uh, from uh, FreeBSD, which is uh, the, one of the big differences from standard distributions, which is GNU tools for this, or BusyBox, for example. It uses the LLVM toolchain to compile all the packages. As a matter of fact, there's currently no GCC in the distribution other than for, uh, for some uh, variants of U boot uh, for specific ARM devices. Uh, it uses uh, the muscle Lipsy, and it's a rolling release distribution, so it, there's not, there are no releases. It sort of updates uh, continuously. And it's also highly portable to many architectures. Uh, right now, uh, we are supporting uh, Arch64, uh, Power, Little Endian, soon there will be Power, Big Endian, uh, x86-64, as well as uh, complete uh, full support for RISC-V 64-bit. Uh, uh, I started this project in early mid-2021, uh, and I, it started with CBuild, which is sort of a meta-build system for packages. Uh, you create your packaging templates, and these uh, basically describe uh, the package and how to build it, uh, and CBuild builds it. Uh, I was a Void Linux developer at this time, and I started CBuild as a way to investigate if I can uh, fix uh, many of the shortcomings of uh, Void Linux's uh, XBPS SRC system. So I have created a quick distribution around CBuild, which consisted of GCC and GNU userland, as well as the XBPS package manager, which Void uh, uses. And at this point, it was only about 50 packaging templates, so it was very tiny. It couldn't boot, uh, definitely, because it had no kernel and no know, like a bootloader or uh, init system even or anything. So it was uh, just uh, like a little container which was uh, capable of building itself when hosted on another distribution. And as I said, I was trying to fix uh, many of the issues and uh, main focuses of uh, CBuild have been performance as well as uh, correctness. This was uh, when I first managed to make uh, Chimera boot uh, in a VM. Uh, Shortly after those 50 packages uh, switched to LLVM and removal of GCC followed, as well as uh, the switch to FreeBSD tools, uh, removal of all the GNU stuff and so on, and as well as uh, gradual expansion of all the packages. Uh, I've been uh, sort of iteratively enhancing the distribution ever since and until it got to the current state. In late 2021, it was possible to boot the system, and it, it's capable of bootstrapping itself. In early 2022, there was uh, a full GNOME desktop already. This was when I got a uh, Wayland compositor running, and of course, uh, everything needs to be able to run Doom, so we, we got Doom working. There's a terminal and some other, other basic stuff, but uh, this was, uh, I believe, uh, around uh, late 2021. I had a talk uh, about the distro at FOSDEM 2022, too, and 
uh, many things happened during 2022. So last year I did the talk as a sort of uh, chronological uh, thing. I'm not going to do that this year because there have been too many things and I couldn't fit it into a 50 minute slot. Uh, huge focus has been uh, in uh, last year on security hardening and on development of uh, different new solutions for things which we've been missing. I'm currently aiming for an alpha release, which will be sort of uh, early adapter release, uh, where things will mostly work on desktop in uh, late February or early March. Uh, I plan to make it uh, coincide, coincide with, uh, with uh, one of the betas of uh, FreeBSD 13.2 uh, in order to be able to re rebase the tooling. Now for some motivations, why did I create this project? I've been uh, unhappy with existing systems. Uh, there are many great things that existing f systems have, but there's always at least one thing which has been annoying me. So I sort of wanted to create a thing which would actually suit me in every single way. And I wanted to make a well-rounded uh, practical operating system that uh, wouldn't be just, uh, just a toy, but uh, something people could actually use. Uh, at the same time, I would like to improve uh, software in general, that is uh, mainly in terms of uh, portability as well as uh, uh, security uh, when it comes to things like usage of sanitizers and so on. I would like to make uh, full use of LLVM, uh, not just to replace uh, GCC compiler, but actually uh, you know, utilize uh, the unique strengths of LLVM, which uh, includes a great uh, sanitizer infrastructure, uh, things like Fin LTO, which GCC still doesn't have, and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, proving Linux is not under GNU Linux uh, is also a major thing. Uh, while doing all this, I wanted to have some fun, and some people on the internet said I couldn't do this. So, of course, it's important to prove them wrong. Uh, I wanted to build a nice community, which uh, would be fun to hang around with and make a good system for both myself and for other people. Now for some uh, general principles of the project. I strongly believe that uh, projects which uh, basically are centered around a single goal are eventually doomed to fail, because once you reach this goal, you have nothing else to do, but at the same time, it uh, creates, uh, uh, you know, like uh, dogmatic uh, things uh, which uh, you are not allowed to cross, and it uh, really restricts you with, uh, with the development. On the other side of the problem, there's scope creep. Uh, if you have uh, too many things uh, to do and you keep expanding on it, eventually you get to the point where you never get anything done. So it's important to balance these things. I think uh, opinionated development is, is overall a good thing because it gives you a sense of direction, which is, which is always nice to have. I think uh, obviously quality of the code matters, but quality of the community ma matters even more so. I think uh, fun is good, so I would like to try to keep it that way and not get uh, too technical in, in the process. I think uh, free and open source uh, software projects are social spaces and that's why if you let uh, toxic people into your community, uh, it's uh, eventually going to become a chore for everybody else. So I try hard to keep them out. But at the same time, I try to make sure it does not get overly elitist because it should be an open, inclusive project for everybody. As for technical principles, uh, I try to make sure things are strict by default and try to avoid technical debt uh, at all costs. There should usually be just uh, one way to do things. Uh, that doesn't mean there only has to be one way, but more like a good default that people are supposed to follow, and that's uh, sort of intuitive and, and easy to, to follow. Things should uh, remain as simple as possible, but not too simple. There are many people who overly focus on things like uh, you know, minimalist uh, systems, and in the process they end up forgetting uh, what's actually practical. I think security and hardening is also very important, and in many Linux distributions uh, it's uh, sort of uh, overlooked. Uh, 
So that's another thing. And I think portability is also extremely important. Uh, there are many kinds of hardware, and people like using many different kinds of hardware. Uh, of course, most people have their x86 computers, but uh, there's uh, more of it than you may think. And things like uh, RISC-V and uh, are taking off, and there's, uh, of course, power workstations, and there's ARM, and so on. So uh, it's good to have all these things. Now, good tooling is also very important, uh, and related to that is uh, self-sustainability. That uh, basically means whatever infrastructure you have uh, should be uh, self-contained and easy to get going and easy to replicate on any new computer. Uh, related to that is being able to bootstrap the system from a source code. Uh, I think that's sort of a double-edged sword because uh, some people don't care about the bootstrap ability at all and things are massive uh, binaries downloaded from the, from the internet. Uh, on the other side of uh, the coin, there's uh, people who insist on complete bootstrap ability from source code for everything, even if it involves uh, doing uh, completely cursed things, uh, such as uh, uh, ever seen uh, how to bootstrap uh, the Haskell compiler from a source completely? It's, it's like uh, if you want to do it, then you have to go through an ancient, unmaintained Haskell compiler which only targets 32-bit x86 computers and like compile some stuff on that, and it's from like 2004, and then you <coughs> have to iterate through newer versions. Uh, eventually, you get to GHC, and then uh, you, you can cross-compile a partial distribution for your architecture and then uh, go from that, and eventually you reach your goal. It's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think... It's a means to an end, and it's important, but uh, not uh, that important. Another thing is that uh, I've seen uh, over the years many things, uh, and I think it's something is written in shell, and it's a complicated program, and it probably shouldn't be. Uh, it should be easy to do the right thing, but tooling should also make it difficult to do the bad thing, kind of steer people towards, uh, you know, doing what's right and. Uh, doing so out of the box. Documentation is obviously also important, and many people avoid writing documentation. I understand them because I'm also guilty of this in many cases. Uh, but yeah, we should strive for a good documentation. There's also the question of uh, systemd. I believe uh, systemd is uh, in many aspects not great, but uh, also it brought uh, necessary change to Linux, and uh, there are basically many people and distributions who just stick their head into the sand and just uh, avoid uh, even considering that uh, systemd might have brought some uh, some useful things and that it might kind of be also their fault that it has uh, become so widely adopted so we should develop uh, good solutions uh, to counter whatever systemd has uh, come up with and uh, basically always try to improve now let's take a look at how a BSD system is developed. Usually you have your entire system in a single tree and a single repository, typically SVN and so on. And you have lots of different components in this repository. It's a complete system capable of boot. So if, if you invoke the central make file and compile the system, you generally compile your kernel and compile your user land. And if you put it together, you will get a system which is capable of booting. And third-party software, is, which is not uh, required uh, for, for the base system, is distributed through some kind of port system. Of course, this doesn't mean that there are no third-party components in the base uh, of the BSD system, because uh, I'm not aware of any BSD system which is uh, developing a complete replacement for the toolchain, for example. You, will, you have uh, your LLVM or, or whatever in base, and usually it, uh, it has uh, its own built uh, system uh, integrated with, uh, with the existing make files, but uh, it, it's a single tree. Now let's uh, contrast it to, to a Linux distribution. In a Linux distribution, it's a collection of uh, software from uh, many different parties, which uh, are separate, separate packages. And you have Linux kernel as the base layer. That's uh, always the case, otherwise it wouldn't be a dis Linux distribution. You have your userland tooling, which is often supplied by GNU, and you have the libc, which is also often supplied by GNU, uh, glibc. And you have the tool chain to build all this. So it's also often GNU because uh, while Clang is used for some distributions, not to <coughs> too many of them. And you have uh, the service manager and so all sorts of auxiliary tooling around to the service, ma service manager. So that's uh, often systemd nowadays. 
This is uh, tied together with a package manager, which, uh, which handles uh, installing and removing and so on. And you sometimes you have, uh, well, usually have uh, some of the components always, and then you can install or remove whatever you want. And Linux plus GCC plus glibc plus core utils, find utils, diff utils, so on, so on. It makes uh, GNU Linux, or what is called GNU Linux. Uh, distributions uh, exist to make sure that all these components work together and they combine well because uh, many different distributions combine them in a different ways and they have different j versions of these components and they all have to play nice. Uh, so uh, the Linux kernel has a rule of uh, never breaking user space. If a new version of Linux kernel uh, results in a, in a binary not working, it means it's a bug in the, in the kernel, even if uh, it was, uh, for example, originally an unintended behavior. So this, is, uh, this is, can be kind of a pain. But let's get back to Chimera. So starting out the tool chain. Uh, LLVM uh, in Linux is pretty seamless nowadays, most of the time. Uh, you have it available on most Linux systems, uh, but on most Linux systems, uh, it's uh, sort of a different arrangement because you do not you do not have LLVM provide the runtime. GCC provides this, and it's called libgcc. It's mostly ABI compatible with uh, with uh, libunwind from LLVM, but it also includes some of these uh, uh, built-ins uh, which are provided uh, via a separate library in LLVM. LLVM comes with its own runtime called uh, CompilerRT, and this is used in Chimera instead of uh, libgcc. For, for the C library, we use Muscle because it's a proven uh, good implementation of a C library, which is used by several distributions already, and you can make most uh, software work on it uh, just fine with uh, maybe with a few patches, <coughs> but uh, better than other Lipsys. Uh, when you have a uh, GNU toolchain, you usually have uh, GNU binutils to complement uh, GCC, uh, as well as ELF utils to provide libelf. Uh, binutils provides things like linker, because GCC does not come with its own linker. It also provides uh, different uh, tools which are used together with the compiler, things like uh, archiver and uh, readelf and uh, this kind of stuff. In Chimera, this is uh, the LLD from LLVM is used uh, as a linker and it's used everywhere. As for the other tooling, which is provided by Binutils, uh, Elf Toolchain provides this uh, tooling and this is also used on FreeBSD uh, to provide these tools. Elf Toolchain also provides a libelf implementation, which replaces the one provided by Elf Utils. Uh, libelf is used in many places, but for example, the kernel requires it. Uh, LLVM also <coughs> provides most of these tools which are provided by libutils. They have a prefix LLVM, so for example, LLVM readelf. Uh, we do not use those uh, in the core system most of the time. So uh, now to sort out the core user land, uh, you have uh, many GNU components as well as uh, non-GNU components, things like core utils, find utils, diff utils, and so on. You have util Linux also, which is used by pretty much all distributions and provides sort of a mixture of uh, tools for all sorts of stuff. Uh, in non-GNU distros, uh, existing ones uh, such as Alpine, you often have BusyBox, which is a sort of uh, single binary, uh, which can be configured to include many different tools, which are otherwise provided by core utils and so on, as well as by util Linux. Uh, the main strength of BusyBox is that it's a single binary, so you can put it in uh, embedded environments and we can have things mostly work. But uh, the other side of the coin is that it's very Spartan when it comes to functionality and the code is also not very good. Uh, but the other alternatives are usually even worse uh, in terms of uh, available functionality. So uh, FreeBSD uh, tools are the answer here, and that's what, uh, what we've done. I found this third-party port of uh, FreeBSD's tools uh, called BSD Utils. It was a sort of uh, incomplete uh, experimental thing, which was uh, not quite ready for an actual system. So I helped uh, complete it and reach parity with core utils. Uh, I fixed many bugs uh, in, uh, which were created during porting in the process. I also ported many other tools to expand coverage, and the result is Chimera Utils, which uh, the distro currently manages. And uh, it's sort of a single, uh, easy-to-build package which uh, includes all of the tooling you want. 
And this replaces not just uh, GNU tooling, but also, for example, a portion of Util Linux, which, uh, which uh, makes things much easier for the distribution, especially in terms of bootstrapping, because, for example, in Void Linux, uh, a, in XBPSSRC, which is the build system which is similar to CBuild, you have a stripped-down version of Util Linux in the base build container, and you need this because some of these tools are necessary. <coughs> but uh, this means a bootstrap problem because uh, when you build a full version of Util Linux, you have uh, many dependencies which you do not want uh, during bootstrapping of your system. Things, uh, for example, UDEF or that, that kind of stuff, which you really don't want to pull in. So it has a stripped down version of Util Linux for that, and then it has a full version which is built separately, and it's it's kind of a mess. If uh, we have a single package for the user land, uh, all of this can be avoided, and then only a partial build of Util Linux can be built if, if needed. Uh, Chimera tools is lean enough for bare environments, uh, things like init RAMFS or even embedded uh, things. But at the same time, it's uh, fully featured enough to be used uh, as uh, interactive tooling, uh, so it's a nice all-in-one thing. And of course, uh, it helps break up uh, the current monoculture of tooling, as well as uh, it's easy to harden. For example, Chimera utilizes uh, client uh, control flow integrity hardening, which uh, can be enabled on Chimera tools <coughs> very easily, and it just works. Now to get uh, the kernel sorted out. These two photos, uh, one is uh, Chimera running on uh, the MNT reform laptop, and the other is uh, running on uh, Raspberry Pi 3. The kernel is uh, mostly compatible with Clang these days, and some patches are needed to support BSD utilities as well as the libelf from ELF tool chain. I would like to eventually upstream these things and make sure things work out of the box. Until recently, there was an issue with uh, the option to use uh, Clang's internal assembler. Uh, it did not work on some architectures, notably 64-bit power, uh, because of some legacy debug info nonsense. So GNU binutils was used for that until, until some time, but uh, nowadays it's not a problem, and the Clang assembler just works for every architecture. CKMS, uh, what is uh, CKMS? Distros usually use a DKMS, which uh, stands for Dynamic Kernel Module System, to build out of three kernel modules. And it's a massive uh, 5K inline bash script, and it has functionality which seemed like a good idea at the time, and it, uh, nobody uses it, and it no longer seems like a good idea, for example. DKMS can uh, package uh, kernel modules, and you can distribute them. And of course, this doesn't work, because every distro has its own kernel, and it can uh, result in, s in slight differences in ABI and so on, so you cannot really do that. I created CKMS, which stands for Chimera Kernel Module System, and it's uh, kind of similar to DKMS, but it's uh, much more lightweight, more robust. It's implemented in Python. Uh, it has uh, privilege separation, so when you have your package manager build a kernel module in a hook uh, during uh, installation and you run your package manager as root, it will properly drop privileges, so it does not run the whole compilation of the module as root, which uh, happens with DKMS and most setups. Now, for the package manager, that's uh, an important thing in a distro. Uh, I considered uh, the FreeBSD uh, package manager at some point, but uh, it was not in quite the shape uh, I would like uh, for production. I did uh, contribute back some uh, patches to fix uh, a bunch of things with muscle, uh, because that was the main, uh, main thing, which, uh, which was really problematic. And I got it working, but uh, there are things such as uh, uh, version expressions and uh, the version string stuff, which uh, needs, uh, which is a work in progress, and it's uh, it's quite obvious that uh, it's mainly all geared towards FreeBSD CUs right now. So eventually, I uh, ended up investigating APK from Alpine Linux, which ended up proving uh, to be a great fit. Uh, it's, it's, for one, it's uh, lightweight, but it's also fairly powerful, and I really like its uh, virtual package uh, system. It uh, handles uh, things like shared libraries very seamlessly, <coughs> where uh, shared libraries uh, in packages are provided basically as uh, virt virtual packages, and uh, this makes it uh, easily searchable, uh, easy for the solver, and so on. 
I eventually transitioned to APK Tools version 3, which is the next generation of APK, which is uh, currently not used by Alpine, and it's not, uh, it does not have a stable release yet, but it works great. Uh, the main difference in APK 3 is that it no longer uses tarballs as packages. It has uh, a new custom uh, uh, sort of structured format, uh, which uh, should help uh, with uh, avoiding uh, vulnerabilities in the package manager. Uh, by summer 2021, uh, it was fully integrated in C build and it just worked. Service management is another big thing you need to boot a Linux distribution. So many options were evaluated in the process. Uh, for example, Runit, which is used by Void Linux, S6, which is uh, sort of a new kid on the block, OpenRC, which is uh, sort of a classic and built uh, on the same principles as classic RC systems. In the end, I ended up choosing uh, Dinit, which is a new, uh, sys a new service manager. Uh, I chose it because uh, it's uh, both powerful and lean. Uh, it's implemented in modern C++, uh, so it's also uh, safer than uh, other, uh, most other service managers. Uh, most importantly, it took me about one afternoon to get it fully working and get to the, get the system from uh, not booting at all to having it completely booting. Uh, it's uh, supervising, which means uh, most services, act most uh, demons are supervised by the service manager by uh, running on the foreground and being basically child processes of the service manager. But you can have uh, background uh, processes as well. It's uh, less robust, so it should be avoided most of the time. It's dependency-based, uh, so it can ensure that uh, your services start in correct order. Uh, it's, it has support for things like one-shots, which uh, help immensely during early boot, because most things you need to do during early boot is uh, basically things you run once, and they do not have any sort of persistent process. So the early boot process is full of one-shots. Uh, for example, Void Linux with Runit uh, it solves it by uh, making these one-shots a bunch of sequential uh, shell scripts, which are run before the actual services are running. And it's another great solution because it's not very flexible. In, in any case, it's a good base for a solid service infrastructure. We have a custom suite of uh, core services for Dinit, uh, written from scratch. It has uh, full support for fine-grained uh, targets. Uh, basically, a target uh, is a logical service which does not uh, do anything by itself, uh, except uh, act as some sort of sentinel. Uh, you can, for example, have a network that's target, and then you can have uh, things, uh, other things say, I want to start before this, uh, and then you can make sure that, uh, or I want to start after this, you can make sure that uh, your services uh, start only after network is up, for example. Uh, it also has first-class support for user services, which is very important, and I'll get to that later. Uh, the eventual goal is to have all long-running uh, processes be services. And there's also the matter of session tracking, which I'll describe in a bit. Now, uh, this is a new project uh, the distro came up with. It's called Turnstyle. And it's uh, an answer to, uh, to the login D part of system D. Linux mostly uses uh, system D login D for session tracking. Uh, what that does is basically uh, know when uh, a user has logged in or when a user has logged in on another console. And it also knows when the user has logged out. And it can be used by, say, desktop environments in, in many different ways. There's eLoginD, which exists as a standalone version, which is basically just ripped, off, ripped away from systemd, and uh, the dependencies are stubbed out, and it's sort of dirty and uh, not, not great. So... Uh, this is done by basically running a daemon, uh, which is called, uh, you know, LoginD, and a module uh, in the PAM infrastructure, which is uh, obviously used for authentication. And the PAM module basically lets the daemon know when a new session has started, and it also lets it know when a session has ended. Uh, this plus seed management, which uh, eLoginD also does, but this is not widely used because usually you only have one seed. This is used by desktop environments, in this, especially things like Wayland compositors. 
Uh, with uh, systemd, uh, most importantly, also as uh, logindy, also spawn a user session of systemd, uh, basically which acts as just like normal service manager, but it runs as your user and it runs user services. Uh, eLogindy cannot do this because it has no idea uh, what uh, other init system or what user service manager you might be running. So this functionality is removed and there's no way to access it. This is one of the reasons why, why I developed this. It aims to eventually replace uh, eLogindy uh, and it uh, was originally created just to manage those user instances of, uh, of Dinit. The issue with that uh, when running this in parallel with uh, eLogindy was that uh, sometimes uh, it needs to know something which eLogindy knows, but uh, sometimes eLogindy also needs to know something the user service manager knows. It uh, especially affects things like uh, lingering, for example. You can enable things, uh, you can enable a specific user to linger, which means those user services will stay up even after you have fully logged out. Uh, eLogindy manages your runtime directory for you, which is used by many services. And uh, upon logout, it removes this runtime directory. If you have still some user services running uh, and, it, and eLogindy has removed your service directory, then uh, things go wrong. So it needs to be integrated, and I pl plan to eventually fully replace Logindy. Turnstyle does not manage seats because there's already, already a project called uh, libseat and ctd which can do this uh, satisfactorily. But uh, libseat does not do the session tracking, so they can be used together. And I plan to provide a library alongside the daemon. This library will provide agnostic API. This API will have multiple backends, and it will have a backend for logindy. It will have a backend for turnstyle D. Uh, as well as potentially other solutions, and then uh, things like desktops will be able to use this and uh, be actually portable because, uh, for example, right now to have a GNOME for on free BSD, for example, it needs uh, many patches to, uh, to, do, to replace this functionality, and it, it's, it's just not great. Having an agnostic API which is not uh, provided by systemd would be a much nicer solution. Of course, I'll also have to convince upstreams to adopt it. One thing which uh, you do with uh, Turnstyle is managing uh, the bus session, uh, bus as a user service. This has an advantage because uh, you have uh, a single session bus uh, per user, just like is done when you have systemd. Uh, well, uh, why have a single session bus? Uh, this session bus uh, has a socket. This socket is somewhere on the file system, and this socket is used to identify other things on the bus. Uh, the way to locate this session bus is... Uh, provided uh, via environment variable. So if you have uh, the environment variable in your environment, uh, then things can use this to read the path and actually locate the socket. Uh, traditionally, you had uh, the session bus started by, for example, your X11 uh, script, uh, Xinit RC, which would run something like dbus run session something. Uh, that means uh, the session bus was only available within your single graphical TTY. Uh, this is not great because then it, when you switch console and log in there and you want to run something which needs to access the session bus, it doesn't know about it. Systemd solves this. Uh, we also solve this by running uh, the session bus uh, as a user service. Uh, so when you first log in, it uh, automatically spawns the session bus. When you last log out, it uh, stops the session bus, and it's available on every single VT. This has also limitless potential for other user services. Uh, we can do things like dbus activation without having dbus uh, spawn the services themselves. It's currently also used for the sound server, for example, with Pipewire. Now let's move on to CBuilt. CBuilt is basically a build system for C ports, as I already only on the standard library. strict uh, and secure. This is what uh, a template might look like. Uh, this is uh, the template to build the Doom game. 
As you can see, it's mostly metadata. Uh, there's one hook in there which uh, runs autoreconf, which, uh, which has no other way to, to do this. There's a build style uh, for configure scripts, which uh, basically strips away all the non-declarative things you would otherwise need. How CBuild works is that uh, it builds all the software in a simple container uh, called the build root in our terminology. It's a minimized uh, Chimera system. Uh, there are some packages which provide a baseline. And uh, your build dependencies, which are specified by the template, are also installed into this container. This uh, container is uh, fully unprivileged, so you don't need to, to run anything as root. And it's fully sandboxed. This is uh, done by, with Linux namespaces. Uh, the container is also read only after the build dependencies are installed, which means uh, no package build can actually change anything in the container otherwise uh, ad other than in its own build directory. It also has, has no network access after, after all the fetch uh, stage things are done. And it has no access to the outside system. Templates are also declarative. Uh, as I said, I delete just metadata. And it has uh, fully transparent support for cross-compiling with uh, most build systems, which means in most uh, templates, you don't need to do anything. And it will be able to of cross-compiling without any additional effort. It has a clean handling of uh, common build systems. This includes uh, configure script, uh, Masson, CMake, and so on. Uh, and it has, uh, it's strict, uh, it has mandatory linting hooks for many things, uh, and unit tests uh, where possible will run out of box. I strongly believe that being strict by default is good because you can always make things more loose if you need it. But if you have things loose by default and then you need to strengthen them, and you have uh, many hundreds to thousands of packages and you need to adjust every single one of them, it becomes uh, effort to, which uh, cannot be done because it's just too much. It has uh, support for things like bulk, bulk builds, uh, where it can properly order things in the batch uh, to build uh, without uh, you know, having uh, dependency ordering issues. It can check upstream uh, projects for new versions and so on. Build flex, uh, all the basic stuff uh, for hardening, uh, which Linux and servers typically use, like Fortify, uh, position independent executables, uh, stack canaries, and so on are used. On, on top of that, we use uh, system-wide LTO for practically every package. I think there's only about 30 templates out of uh, close to 1,000 which, uh, which have LTO disabled for different reasons. In some cases, uh, it could be enabled, but it's, it's not worth it. We do utilize a system-wide subset of uh, undefined behavior sanitizer. Uh, it uh, deals with uh, things like uh, trapping signed integer overflows in order to avoid uh, potential problems. Also, CFI, or con control flow integrity, is, uh, is used for many packages. Uh, it cannot be used for all because it breaks on a lot of stuff. It's, it's very strict when it comes to typing of functions. But it's, it, it's still used on a couple hundred packages. Uh, the allocator. Uh, we now use uh, the Scudo allocator from LLVM, which is also used, for example, on Google Android. Uh, it replaces the allocator in muscle. Uh, this is not because of hardening, because the muscle allocator is uh, already hardened, but uh, Scudo is also, also hardened allocator. But it has significantly better multi-threaded performance because the muscle malloc ng uses a single global lock. This is uh, a trade-off, but uh, it also means that the stock allocator in muscle performs poorly in, uh, in many things, and it's uh, something people commonly complain about, so we now rely on Scudo. Uh, there's also the advantage of uh, being able to eventually deploy GWP ASAN, which is sort of a sampling uh, runtime version of address sanitizers, which, which can catch many memory errors at runtime with uh, minimal performance overhead. This is not enabled yet, but it will be at some point. Other core things for the distro, some tooling is taken from Debian. For example, we use initramfs tools uh, to generate uh, initramfs images because other solutions were generally found to be unsatisfactory. Uh, for example, requiring uh, bash uh, for the hooks and so on. Uh, initramfs tools is very clean and simple and nice to work with. Uh, we also use console setup from Debian to do console and keyboard configuration, as well as the script uh, for handling encrypted drives. Eventually, I also had to add some other things like the grab bootloader support for ZFS. We now support uh, root on ZFS uh, very easily and so on. 
This is was uh, this is Chimera desktop on uh, on RISC V. Uh, you can see it runs things like Firefox, for example, which uh, does not build out of box, but I made it work. Uh, this is on the Hi5 unmatched uh, board from C5. Uh, when I when I was starting to add to the desktop, first thing I added was uh, the Western Wayland Compositor as well as GTK. This sort of provided a baseline set of uh, dependencies, which uh, are also used by pretty much everything else. So then I expanded uh, with uh, Exodark stack, uh, things like the Enlightenment uh, window manager as well as PEGWM for a simple X11 window manager. I added the multimedia stack including FFmpeg, GStreamer, media players and so on. And in spring 2022 uh, I added the GNOME desktop which is uh, the default uh, choice. But of course you can use anything else you want. I also added web browsers. This includes Epiphany, which comes with GNOME uh, and is built on WebKit, and Firefox, uh, which is alternative choice, and of course, uh, some games. As I said before, I would like to release an alpha version in late February or early March. Uh, I'm not sure if this will happen, but I hope it will. Uh, before doing this, I would like to perform a complete world rebuild of all the packages because uh, I have uh, introduced some things in CBuild which I would like propagated into e existing packages and it's not. So just to be clean, I would like to build everything with LVM15 as it is right now and uh, basically then release the alpha. I will need to launch automatic built infrastructure. I currently have a server in Nicolo in, in my city, but it's not on public network yet, so I need to set up the public network and, la and launch uh, things like uh, this and as well as CI. I would like to clean up the remaining fallout from the recent hardening uh, stuff, uh, as well as update every template to its latest version. And after alpha, which is uh, the alpha cycle is expected to take about half a year to one year. I would like to add a libgcc compatibility shim so we can run existing binaries because right now you cannot run existing binaries because the system runtime is different. I would like to add support for dbus activation so dbus uh, does not run uh, daemons uh, by itself uh, through dbus uh, service files but instead uh, do it uh, uh, instead delegate it to the service manager. I would like to investigate additional hardening things like uh, LVM safe stack. And I would like to improve the documentation. Right now there's uh, the beginning of, uh, of Chimera handbook, which includes some handy basic information like uh, you know, installation and how to set up encrypted drives and so on, but uh, it can always use more documentation. And local support is also another thing I would like to expand. This is the problem in uh, pretty much all muscle distros with uh, the local support being uh, sort of limited and you can have translations but things like you know formats and so on. So uh, the conclusion, uh, we are currently nearing usability and it's, uh, it should be suitable for early adopters by March. I would like to get all the major changes done by beta and continue packaging uh, more software as well as cooperate with upstreams including the free BSD upstream on uh, sensing uh, fixes uh, in tool tooling and so on. In any case, thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, you can ask them. Uh, of course, we also have stickers, so come pick them up. Yeah? Do you understand if zero trust and root is supported or yet to come? Yeah, as I said, it's supported. Uh, I recently introduced it and I recently tested it. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. He was asking if uh, ZFS on the root is supported. Uh, yeah, it's supported. Uh, it uses the upstream uh, scripts uh, for Ethereum MFS tools. Uh, just uh, patched uh, to support uh, the user land because we don't use BusyBox. Uh, and it, it just works. Uh, we also provide uh, ZFS packages with uh, pre-compiled binary modules, uh, so it's not uh, necessarily compiled from source uh, during uh, installation. And CKMS uh, can handle uh, things in a non-conflicting way, so if you have the package installed for the stock kernel which provides the binary ZFS modules, CKMS will not try to build uh, the modules again. Yeah? Okay. Uh, well, the question was uh, if what's the target audience basically? 
Uh, well, uh, I would say the primary audience is uh, basically the same people who would use things like uh, Gentoo and so on. Basically, power users uh, who can find uh, their way around things because there's no insistence on providing uh, graphical clickable stuff for everything because it just wouldn't be possible. I just do not have uh, the, the manpower to do all this. So, uh, so yeah, it's for power users who can find their way around a simple system. Yeah? Uh, where does the name Ibero come from? Uh, he was asking uh, where, does, where does the name ca come from. Well, uh, Chimera is basically like a mythical monster made up of three different animals. So. Uh, so it should be fairly obvious, like where it, where it comes from. We have a uh, Linux kernel and FreeBSD stuff and other stuff. Yeah. Can you work with upstream in particular with FreeBSD to <coughs> you know, change the specs? Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the question was if I'm working with uh, Free FreeBSD. Uh, I know uh, the project has taken back some of the changes. Uh, I have some patches uh, in Chimera Utils, which I, which I do believe would be useful for upstream. And yes, I do want to submit, submit to them upstream. For example, I have a, a fix in, uh, in the sort tool, which uh, fixes uh, uh, a crash with uh, control flow integrity hardening. Uh, so this would be nice to include, for example. Yeah? <coughs> Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Does Turnstile use C groups? Uh, question is if Turnstile uses uh, C groups. Uh, no, it doesn't. It uses uh, this, it does the same thing as LoginD. Basically, it uses a PAM module uh, to report things, and it keeps a persistent socket connection to the daemon uh, as long as the session is active. And then uh, when the socket is closed and when uh, the daemon receives uh, basically a notification pulse on the socket, uh, and it, once it knows uh, the connection has been closed, then it closes the session inside of the daemon. Yeah? Right, follow-up question. Um, so you open a socket from the PAM uh, service module? Uh, the question is if I open the socket from the PAM uh, module. Uh, Yes, so the PAM module opens a connection to the socket which is provided by the daemon, and the daemon uh, basically opens the socket uh, in the system as a Unix domain socket, and it's uh, only accessible by root, obviously, so the PAM uh, module accesses it. Yeah? Probably this is the last question. So if you open a socket from the PAM module, um, that socket obviously ends up appearing as a file descriptor inside the program that ran the ran PAM. Does that not interfere with anything? Have you not found anything that closes for, for like legs? Because I've tried to do the same thing. And, uh, uh, the question is if uh, if uh, if the PAM module uh, with the socket actually interferes uh, with anything. No, I found it doesn't interfere with anything. And in fact, uh, as far as I know, LoginD does basically the same thing. And other solutions for handling, uh, for example, there are several solutions for handling the runtime directory, which is basically run user uh, your UID. And uh, they basically did the same thing as, as far as I know. But yeah, uh, as far as I can tell, it, it, it works OK. Yeah? So first of all, thanks for your job. It must be like really difficult to maintain all this dependence. Thank you. Right? So my question is, uh, are you planning to integrate like any specific SSL library, like, for example, LibreSSL or like uh, OpenSSL? OK. Uh, the question was about uh, integrating SSL library. Uh, we do use OpenSSL uh, version 3. Okay. This was actually a pretty big uh, transition <coughs> when, when it happened, because many things uh, do not or did not work well with OpenSSL 3. Fortunately, the amount of packages right now is not uh, that huge. There are still some which do not work with OpenSSL 3 and which we do rely on. For example, the Heimdall uh, implementation of uh, Kerberos, which we use instead of uh, MIT CarB. Uh, does not work with OpenSSL free yet, but it has uh, its b own built-in crypto, which uh, can be used instead. So we fall back on that for now. Anybody else? Looks like that's it then. And thank you again. <laughs>